And good evening. My name is Denny Smith. Welcome to the show. You know, every so often I come across a story that that just startles me. Tonight I'm going to introduce you to a couple of authors with a story to tell that did more than startle me. It scared me a little bit. Nearly 50 years ago, three hunters went into the woods around Cisco Grove in California. That's in and around Sacramento area. One of them got terribly lost and soon found himself all alone in the dark and being chased by a predator that was like none other than any of us could ever imagine. Well, to help me tell the story this evening are two fellows, Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte, authors of a new book, Aliens in the Forest, The Cisco Grove UFO Encounter. And uh, Noe and Ruben, welcome to 93 WIBC in Central Indiana. It's good to have you boys. Thank you very much, Dare, uh, for, for inviting us. This is Ruben calling from the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco Bay Area. The San Francisco Bay Area. And Noe, where are you? Yes, sir, Danny. Thank you for having us on with you tonight. Looking forward to one of the most amazing UFO stories that I have ever run across. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm calling in from South Texas along the Rio Grande. Yeah, well, salute. All right. Now, before we get to the story, Noe, uh, I'll just ask the quick question. How long have you guys been working together on UFO research? Yes, Ruben uh, and I, uh, we've had the good fortune to have a partnership and a friendship that goes back almost 10 years. We started working. Our first book was a, a book called Mexico's Roswell, and it was based on a reported UFO mid-air collision between a small plane and, and a flying saucer over West Texas uh, back in the 70s. So we started working on that about 2005, uh, and uh, so we've had, uh, you know, it's been a great ride. We've been out uh, doing field investigations in the middle of the Mexican desert on that case and, and many other places. So well, this it's is been good a to, wild adventure. It's good to have you both. Now, Ruben, let's go back to Friday, September 4, 1964. I was 12 years old at that time, Ruben. And this 26-year-old factory worker by the name of Donald Trump heads into the woods to go hunting with his bow and, his, and three arrows. Now, get us started, Ruben, and tell us where Mr. Shrum went hunting that day. Well, basically, both um, he and his two other friends were going to go deer hunting, and they went out to an area in a remote area of California. It's known as Cisco Grove. It's part of the Tahoe National Forest, very mountainous area, along, and it runs close to the border uh, going toward uh, uh, Nevada in uh they and they went uh, hunting, um, and they basically at that time, Danny, they didn't uh, have walkie-talkies or anything like that. But they kept uh, each other in line of sight, and it was in a very mountainous area that uh, that where they had set up camp. Um, as they all used bows and arrows, uh, that was only permitted during that that period for hunting deer. Um, they each went their way. And uh, Mr. Don Shrum went up to uh, along a very rocky uh, area as he climbed upward, and it started to get later. It started to get dark, and he basically wandered off too far from the um, from 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 the uh, campsite. So um, he then, as uh, most hunters do, um, because it was getting very dark, uh, he climbed up a tree. And uh, from that, he, 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 he was seeking refuge to protect himself from predators, because in that area there, uh, we have a lot of uh, mountain lions and bears. So. You know, that's a big part of the story, Ruben, this tree climbing. Now, Noe, he was planning on hunting just that day, or was he planning on a longer time in the forest? Were they going to be there for three or four days, or was it just this one day that he was planning on hunting, Noe? No, it was basically an overnight uh, stay there. Uh, they had started early in the day on Friday. Um, they had a, an extra long weekend. I believe it was a three-day weekend. And so uh, they had started early, and they hadn't had much luck uh, finding prey. And then as, as it got dark, they were planning to all assemble back at the campsite that they had staked out earlier in the day. Uh, but as Ruben just mentioned, what happened is that all three of them got separated from each other. And uh, before they realized it, it was nearly dark, and... Uh, the, the two companions that went along with Mr. Shrum were able to 
just barely get back uh, in touch with each other at the camp right before it got totally dark. So they reconnected and got back to camp. Uh, but but uh, Mr. Shroom, because he had gone out to the very end of this very long ravine and then found no way to cross across to the other side, uh, he had to backtrack, and there was no way he could make it back to camp. It became obvious to him. And this was kind of an unfamiliar area for him. He had been out hunting in other parts uh, around Sacramento, but uh, in this place... Uh, he was worried of, uh, like Ruben mentioned, he was worried of running into perhaps a, a bear or a mountain lion. And uh, there was also the added danger that the terrain was very rocky and, yeah. and there were ravines right. he and was, canyons. Uh, he was, uh, once he found himself almost lost, he did exactly what most hunters do. He started climbing right. the ridge. Now, on the phone with me this evening, Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte. They have written a book called Aliens in the Forest, the Cisco Grove UFO Encounter. And we're telling the story of... One Donald Trum, 26-year-old factory worker, and he headed in the woods to go hunting with his bow. Had three arrows. He went with a couple of companions. The companions make it back to campsite uh, towards dark. But poor Mr. Shrum, we are about to tell you a story. Now, uh, knowing the trees do have a lot to, to do with this story, he decided to uh, spend the evening in the in the tree. Right. Now, is it common for guys there in, in California to just climb a tree and strap in? Okay, well, the concept here, Denny, is uh, the hunter needs to find a place that is uh, sheltered and protected from predators and other dangers. So if you're going to find, you know, a a cave maybe or a a place between some boulders, some place where you can hole up for the night, uh, but another uh, another, uh, option would be to go up in a tree he had a military-style belt uh, strapped around him, so he was able to strap that belt around one of the larger limbs up near the top to keep him uh, in place you know, right. so that he won't fall down from there. All right. And so that was the option that he chose. All right. Now, Reuben, how was he dressed? I don't know what the weather was like in September of 1964. In here in the fall, it would be a little bit chilly, but what was it like in Cisco Grove, California in 64, Reuben? Well, um, as Zoe was mentioning that... Um <clears throat> they were uh, where he, Mr. Shrum, was wearing a camouflage uh, jacket and a hat. Um, he, he did wear a, a t-shirt and um, and just camouflage pants and that. Um, he wasn't really really prepared for very very cold weather, but it does get uh, during that time in the elevation. It does snow quite a bit, and so, and something. Um, I just want to go back uh, on the point that what uh, Noe was mentioning about the predators and uh, and bears. Uh, we just found we're, we're always finding some new information every time in, in our investigations. And one of the things we just found out that what Don has shared with us was that when he climbed up that tree, he noticed that there were some bear claws. Oh, good lord! Yeah, on, on the on the tree bark, and so <laughs> you know, uh, tree. You know, bears do climb up trees, so yeah. uh, they, he, he was <laughs> nervously, when he climbed up the tree, he looked around and uh, to make sure there wasn't anything up there. So On the phone with me this evening, Ruben Uriarte and Noe Torres, uh, they are two UFO um, investigators. They have written a book called Aliens in the Forest, the Cisco Grove UFO Encounter. And it is the story of a, of a hunter, a couple of, well, actually three guys, but one of them had a, a very special encounter. Now, this case has a lot of similarities, though, uh, to other well-known UFO cases, including uh, Barney and Betty Hill back in 1961. Now, that was Pascagoula, Mississippi. Um, and then there's the Travis Walton abduction in 75, where, they, where he gets picked up and says, you know, he encountered these people. But this one's not as well-known. Why is this one sort of kept secret? Well, it's very interesting, Denny. Uh, actually, those three cases that you just mentioned were all worked by some of the most famous uh, UFO investigators of the 1960s and 70s, including Dr. J. Ellen Hynek and Dr. James Harder, Dr. Anita Brothers. Uh, it was three cases that are very well known in the annals of UFO history. But the reason that uh, Mr. Shrum's encounter that we're, we're talking about tonight, the Cisco Grove encounter, the reason it didn't get the media exposure that the others do is because of the fact that he worked for an aerospace defense contractor in Sacramento, California, that actually the leading uh, manufacturer of missiles and rockets for the U.S. military in the early 60s was the Aerojet Corporation. 
And Mr. Shrum was employed by Aerojet, in fact, won several awards with them for his work in welding and also painting the missiles, including the Polaris and the Triton missile systems. So and he really his work because of its sensitive nature and being a, a defense contractor with the with the U.S. government. He did not want his identity to be known, and so he withheld that from the UFO uh, investigation community. And therefore, you know, anytime you have a UFO story and you don't have an actual human being to attribute it to, that makes it less valuable uh, to the media and, and in terms of exposing it. Oh, uh, no, so that, that was the one element that hurt his story and made it be not as well known as the others. Now, this is a great story, folks. When we come back, uh, in addition to our uh, conversation with Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte, uh, with their book, Aliens in the Forest. We've got some uh, clips from original uh, interviews that were done with Mr. Shrum. When we come back, we're going to have that, along with the continuing conversation with Nori Torres and Ruben Uriarte, right here on the Denny Smith Show in 93 WIBC. And good evening once again. My name's Denny Smith. You know there is a band around our galaxy that's known as the Goldilocks Zone. For those of you who remember the story of Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold, but just right to support life of some sort. I have uh, always had a feeling that there were there was other life out there. I think you look up in the heavens sometimes and you say, golly, did God just leave us here all by ourselves or is there other form of, of life? And again and again we hear stories, and whether it is the story of uh, Betty and Barney Hill who were abducted back in 1961, there's the very famous story of the Pascagoula, Mississippi incident in 73. Travis Walton was abducted in 75, and now we have learned from authors Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte of Aliens in the Force. We're going back to 1964. 26-year-old factory worker Donald Shrum heads into the woods just to go hunting uh, with a couple of his buddies. And what's about to happen to him is unbelievable. He is at the bottom of a ravine, and he's, it's getting dark, and he knows he has to hook back up with his partners who he has lost. This is 64, before walkie-talkies. And uh, they had lost sight of one another. His two buddies make it back to camp. But poor Donald Trump uh, climbs a ridge to get up high so that he can see. Now, we're about to play a clip for you that uh, uh, Noe and Reuben have come across. And uh, Mr. Shrum is in the forest in the dark of night. He's up in a tall pine tree, and he sees something. Well, what did he see? Well, here's the audio clip. And waved my arms and yelled and screamed. And, and uh, finally, uh, that light started coming towards me. So I was really relieved then because I thought it was a helicopter still until it got within... Oh, maybe 60 feet or yards. I'm not sure the distance at night. Uh, but it just stood, hovered there with no sound. So then I panicked because I knew it was no helicopter. I thought it was something from outer space. But it looked like all I could see is a little, about an 8-inch glow. So I thought it was just a little tiny flying saucer. Then I kind of panicked and I threw my bow up in the tree again and hand walked out there that limb and got up in the tree but then this this light went a half circle around me over the canyon then I could see the whole shadow of the whole uh, spacecraft and it was that was just a, a light that was on the nose of it all right now I suppose that is the voice of Donald Trump. Noe, where did these recordings come from? We're going to be listening to several of these recordings this evening. Where did these uh, audio clips come from? Okay, this was an exclusive interview that was conducted by my pal Ruben, who's on with us tonight, and um, he uh, interviewed, sat down. In fact, he spent uh, several days at the Shrum residence uh, talking to them about this case, gathering information about it. So. Um, and, and later on in some of the clips, the clips uh, we'll hear Reuben in the background. Yeah, this You know, I thought I recognized that voice, yeah. Noe. No. <laughs> All right, now, how long ago did this take place, Reuben? When did you do these interviews? Oh, it was uh, around um, 2005, um, right around in September. As Noe had mentioned, I was uh, very uh, fortunate to have had the, the opportunity to stay over their home as a guest, and we went through the 
basically through the, through the whole event. Uh, I just need to backtrack just a little bit that uh, the principal investigator that was involved in this case uh, was uh, Mr. Paul Cerny, who was with our with who was at that time with NICAP, and that was another the. Um, at the organization is known as the National Investigation Committee on Aerial Phenomena. And, Danny, what happened was that uh, Mr. Um, Paul Cerny had all these documents um, that he had acquired based on his investigation. And so when Were I those became, military documents, uh, Ruben? Because it, that seemed to be the only one who'd really investigated it. Was it, was well, it all military? Yeah, we'll definitely we'll get into about the military and okay. their involvement in this, uh, Danny. All right. But what what happened here was that um, uh, Mr. Paul Cerny was later um, he passed away back in the year 2000, and I became the the Northern California director for MUFON Mutual UFO Network, and I acquired a number of of, of his archives, and in that was all his field notes and documents of, of this extraordinary case. Which uh, through some other, and I told myself, I said one of these days I would want, I need, I need to meet this gentleman, and um, who who had the strange encounter. So through some very um, opportunities through, through some, uh, these connections that I was able to make, um, was able to meet with them, and they uh, allowed me to stay at their home. And um, their son did the videotaping, and out of that we were able to acquire these audio clips. This is just uh, phenomenal, Ruben. Now, a lot of people don't know, when you, when these things get buried in, in notebooks or when they get buried in research, digging them back out and then trying to find the players and find where they were, did he live basically in the same place uh, all this time or had he moved around a bit? Did you have, any, did you have trouble finding him? Oh, no, actually, uh, <clears throat> quite a, what was interesting, um, their home, it was approximately about 40, uh, 45 minutes away from the actual site uh, where the incident had happened. <laughs> if I'd have been him, I'd have moved to Mississippi. <laughs> I got us so far away from that place. <laughs> oh, my God. Actually, um, he, the, him and his family have now relocated somewhere back in the Midwest, but we, we're always in contact. So uh, I just would definitely wanted to give you an, an, an overview of how right. we got connected. And then through uh, my, my uh, work with Noe, we're, and, and thanks to him, we were able to put this into a book. All right, now, Noe Torres, Ruben Uriarte, you just heard the voice of Ruben. Noe Torres is with him. Uh, Aliens in the Forest is the name of this book. Now, Noe, um, did Mr. Shrum's hunting companions... Now, we just heard this clip where he says he saw this, and he, of course, he's lost. He lit three fires, which is what you're taught to do to light three signal fires. And he's waving between two of these fires, and all of a sudden, what he thinks is a helicopter in a helicopter, and he probably didn't have solid stools for a month after that. But that being said, did anybody else see this uh, mothership of sorts come over? Yeah, no. that's exactly right, Denny. Uh, the uh, sh- the ship, as it, as it got close, uh, because of his familiarity with uh, with mili- military air vehicles and working for a defense contractor, he knew for certain that this was not one of ours. You know, and. Uh, when it when the ship first came through the Earth's atmosphere and appeared down below over the the forest, it was seen by one of the other hunters. Uh, Mr. Alvarez uh, was one of the companions, and he later filed an affidavit, um, a written affidavit, in which he uh, stated that he saw the ship descend out of the atmosphere and and came down, um, and he saw it uh, hovering over in the uh, a little bit far away from where he was standing Vincent Alvarez and uh actually where it, where it was hovering of course was over at the location where uh Don Shrum was up in a tree so so he witnessed uh the entrance of the mothership into the scene now we're talking about the mothership that has visited our hunter friend his name is Donald Shrum on the phone with me, Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte. They have written a book called Aliens in the Force. And I tell you what, it's, it's a terrific tale. Uh, by the time we get done, I know that you're going to want to learn more about this. All right, uh, Ruben, back to you. Um, we know that there's a mothership. Uh, Danny's going to play another clip here. And uh, all of a sudden, a second ship appears. I saw three panels of light, like windows or whatever. I saw a flash come from the bottom of the center one and just saw a dark object go down 
in the canyon and then I lost track of it. Then the next thing I saw was a little blinking light up on the top of originally where the, the first one ca came from. This object that you first saw that left the, the, the uh, center panel, what did it look like, Don? Well, at that time all I saw was a flash and saw a dark object go down. When it landed up on the ridge, I could see uh, like a, a half, I could only see part of the top, but it had a little light on it. it looked like a, the top of a flying saucer really? that I'd seen in pictures. Like a dome? Or yes, or a, yeah, like a dome. Okay. So I kept my eyes on that. All right, so there's our clip number two from Donald Trump, our hunter. Now, uh, earlier today, um, Ruben, I, I sent this off to a couple of my classmates, and one of the guys listened to it, and he wrote back, and he said, do you believe this guy? Now, Ruben, before you tell me if you believe him, I'm going to tell you that at one point I had 1,200 plumbers working for me in five states, and I thought I was a pretty good judge of character when somebody was lying to me. I don't think this guy is lying. He seems as genuine as my dirty socks in the hamper back home. Tell me what your perception when he when you were interviewing did you get any, did you get any body language that uh, sensed that this man was deceiving you? Well, the thing of the, <clears throat> there, there's two points. One thing that really amazed me was uh, the story that he shared with with me um, was very much consistent with uh, the overall interview that Mr. Paul Cerny had conducted back almost forty fifty years ago, and so this. So basically, Don it didn't miss much of a beat. I mean, he kept the story very much um, intact. But the other thing that really outstanding, that I found very outstanding and and also um, kind of troubling too was, I could tell on his on his, his body language, his face, his expressions, that this really bothered him. He really went through a very very uh, shocking experience. And it's it still affects him today. Um, he's still uh, suffering from from uh, nightmares, and uh, so having him relive the account with me, uh, you could see that that it troubled him very much. You are hearing the voice of Ruben Uriarte, who has interviewed a gentleman. When we come back, we are going to meet the aliens as they make their appearance. My name's Denny Smith, along with new friends Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte, right here on 93 WIBC. 93 WIBC. My name's Denny Smith. Thanks for being a part of the show. Tonight, we're talking about UFOs. And before you think that we're too far off in the giggle weeds, I want you to know that the, the two, two fellows that are joining me here this evening, Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte, they're the real deal, folks. These guys have been together for 10 years, and uh, the research that they have done uh, goes back to some research that was done uh, many, many years ago, uh, back in 1964-65, an original interview that was done by Paul Cerny. Mr. Cerny passes away in the year 2000, and he had interviewed a fellow who claimed to have seen a UFO, and not only that, that he had been pursued by aliens. And we will get to that part of the story. But before we do that, Noe, when uh, we say that Donald Trump saw a UFO, we need to put that in perspective. He later described the size of this mothership. Can you share with us just how big this thing was? Yes, it was difficult for him at first to see the full extent of it, as we heard on the earlier audio clip from Mr. Shrum. But when it finally came around close to the tree and he saw that this small light that he had been seeing for quite some time was actually only part of this immense structure. It was a cylindrical shaped object about 150 feet in diameter. So in other words, it was like a 14-story tall building turned on its side, an immense object. Uh, the people that we've told this story to have to have have said have commented that it, this is one of the largest uh, ships that uh, you know it's not typical of a lot of UFO sightings where you have a much smaller craft. And then of course he saw the, these three large uh, rectangular panels on the on the side of the hull, and then it it uh, one of those the middle one uh, out of the middle one came out this smaller ship. Uh, which is 
uh, which is where the beings or the entities that he encounters next in the story, that's where they came yeah. out of. Now, Reuben, Mr. Shrum must have been extremely uh, concerned. I, I would say that just terrified, but he did not hear anything, did he, Reuben? Did he hear any noise from this craft at all? Uh, no, he didn't. Uh, that's what uh, frightened him. Um, as he had mentioned, he saw this light, and when he later saw this immense object right above the tree and, and he heard no noise, that's what really frightened him. And All, knew All right, now we're going to play another clip here, and this is when the humanoids, what he called, now there's a couple characters, folks. We, we have humanoids, and we're going to have some robots. The first ones to come out are going to be the humanoids. So let's hear what he, uh, Mr. Shrum has to say about the humanoids. I heard some thrashing through the brush in probably five, ten minutes. These two humanoids come out of the brush, and they kind of broke some of the brush off and was looking at it. And then they came straight underneath the tree and looked up at me. And I, I knew right then I was fingered. <laughs> <laughs> they found you. Yeah, they found me. Can you describe them for us? Tell us briefly what they Yeah, like. they were looked like uh, four to five feet. Of course, I'm looking down at them. So they, they'd be shorter than they probably are. And uh, they had a silvery, like a one-piece uh, suit on. And it seemed like it had the, the joints, puffy joints, you know, on the shoulders and the, and the elbows. And, and the legs I didn't see that clear. The humanoids, um, what did they, were you able to see their faces? No, uh, it was just a kind of a dark shadow. I could see the the two uh, like eyes that were looked like welding goggles to me. They were the same as welding goggles, and then the rest of the face was kind of a uh, blur. I couldn't see looking down at them. Was it large or small? They're they're, they're about two inches in diameter. It reminded me just like I said, like a w welding goggles. You have just listened to an interview that took place back in 2005. Uh, one of our authors this evening, Ruben Uriarte, sat down and videoed and uh, did some audio recording with Mr. Mr. Donald Shrum. Back on September 4, 1964, this 26-year-old factory worker just went into the woods to go hunting. He took his bow, a few arrows. He was in complete camouflage, and he ended up um, encountering something uh, beyond this world. Now, Noe... Did the humanoids make any aggressive moves uh, towards Donald Trump? Were they carrying any weapons? Mr. Shrum observed that they appeared to be carrying no kind of tools or instrumentation or weaponry of any kind, and they made no aggressive moves toward him during the first part of the encounter. Um, so, and, and another, just an interesting sidelight here, Denny, if I could just take a moment. There's a lot of similarities between this and the Travis Walton encounter because, you know, Travis Walton was abducted from a forest in northern Arizona, and he, was, uh, he found himself aboard this craft, and he saw two distinctly different types of beings, uh, just as um, Mr. Shrum saw two different types of beings. And uh, Walton also uh, classified one of the two as being more humanoid than the others. Uh, the others were shorter and stockier. And the other interesting uh, correlation between these two cases is that Travis, and I just spoke to him recently, we had a UFO conference here in Laredo, Texas, and he talks about how captivating those dark, round eyes of the beings that he saw aboard the craft, they, they burned into his mind, so to speak. And Mr. Shrum described... In his uh, later in in his interview, he described the very same thing about how the eyes of these creatures just kind of uh, just frightened him a great deal, and he kept that memory very vivid in his mind for the rest of his life. You know, I can remember the first time I got called into the principal's office, and I can tell you what color the principal's eyes were, and I can tell you just about how many whiskers he had on his face. When you are in trouble. There's something about your senses that starts to drink it in, and it just burns into your mind. Now, uh, Reuben, what happened after the humanoids arrived on the scene? What was going on down there? Well, as Noe had mentioned, they weren't carrying any instrumentation, but one of the things that Mr. Shrum noticed was that they were very curious. Uh, these humanoids were very curious 
in studying the plant life around there. You know, the manzanita bushes, the rocks, the, almost like scientists. <clears throat> and then um, he noticed that they uh, started walking over toward the tree, toward him, and then another being started to also walk in that direction, which, uh, as we know, he's had mentioned, um, it was uh, a robot-like creature. That, That's uh, exactly, yeah, and when we come back, we're yeah. going we're gonna to meet this robot. On the phone with me this evening, Ruben Uriarte and Noe Torres, they have written a book called Aliens in the Forest. We are blessed that uh, in 2005, Ruben uh, sat down uh, with the protagonist in this, a fellow by the name of Donald Trump. He was 26 years old at the time. Uh, that would make him, what, 74 or 75 now? But, yeah, uh, he's about 74 or 75. 74 right? 75. All right, when we come back, we're going to meet the robot. My name's Denny Smith, along with my buddies from Aliens in the Forest right here on 93 WIBC. Well, my name's Denny Smith, and I tell you what, it's rare that I get a chance to talk to the real deal. Tonight on the phone with me, Noe Torres, Ruben Uriarte, they're the real deal. They have done uh, their own investigation of a story that goes back to 1964. A hunter by the name of Donald Shrum heads off to go hunting with his bow and arrows. Um, and uh, the rest is is a story for the ages. Now, we're about to meet, we've already met the humanoids uh, who have come out of a mothership that is 18 stories wide. There's a couple of other ships that come out, and they deliver a, a couple what we are going to describe as scientists. Uh, they are looking at the plant life. They have certainly noticed that our hunter is up in the tree, um, shivering like a dog passing fish hooks, I'm sure. But he's fully clothed in camouflage. And then all of a sudden, we have somebody new arrive on the scene. And, and here's uh, what our hunter had to say. Then I saw two flashing red orange light eyes come at, just picking his way down the ridge, just between the rocks and and around them and everything and come down and was on the, this big boulder, this big flat rock. He kind of looked up at me and he moved his hand in, in this, through the fire cinders and kind of scattered them. The eyes of this other uh, creature, like uh, the robot, what, what did that look like to you? It had uh, kind of like fire, orangish, reddish orange or yellowish orange, and they it kind of flickered like fire, and they're about the same diameter as uh, about two inches in diameter as the humanoids. Boy, this is the most amazing of stories. My name's Denny Smith. Joining me this evening are UFO investigators Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte. Now, Ruben, when you uh, I'm going to come back to this interview that you did with Donald Trump. Did you sense any deception at all? from Mr. Shrum when you were interviewing him? Oh, none whatsoever. Um, you know, I, I used to work as a counselor. I work a lot with, with people with many clients, and uh, so I ha- have a pretty good uh, judge of character working with people, and at the same time just reading his body language and also how it affected his family. His wife um, was very, very much supportive of him, and it affected her as well as their family. So... They were. They had no reason to uh, make up a hoax, and it, 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 in the story is so incredible. It's almost. It's even better than science fiction. But at the same time, it really makes you wonder if we how how we are how there might be more other visitors from visiting our our planet. If you folks of you have just joined us on the phone with me this evening is Noe Torres, Ruben Uriarte. They are authors of a book called Aliens in the Forest, the Cisco Grove UFO Encounter. And this all came about from notes from an original interview that were uh, that was done by Paul Searney, uh, who was part of NICAP. And that was um, uh, and the, the, you know, it's a UFO organization before MUFON. Now, he died in 2000, but he left his notes. Uh, Ruben uh, acquired the post or the position that Paul Cerny used to have, and he figured out that this guy might still be alive, this Donald Trump, the hunter that has seen and has been telling us the story that you've been hearing by tape. Now, um, Noe, do you think Mr. Shrum believed this being uh, was a mechanical man, or could it have been a humanoid, another one of the humanoids, just wearing some kind of bulky suit? Okay, that's a very good question, and I've heard, um, I listened very carefully to the original interview done by Mr. Cerny uh, back in, uh, within months of the encounter, 
And I've also listened to the interviews done more recently with Mr. Shrum, including the one that Ruben, uh, that we've taken audio clips from and are listening to tonight. And Mr. Shrum is very clear in saying that he was not, he's not 100% certain that this was a mechanical creature. That was just simply the impression, the overall impression of the creature's movements. He moved a little bit more stiffly than the humanoids. He seemed to be, uh, the creature seemed to be, um, have a little more of a metallic appearance. However, uh, he he has said during several interviews that it could very well have been uh, just another one of the same type of being, the humanoid, in a bulkier type of suit. So that's possible. I, I sense that he described this suit somewhat like we would uh, send in a bomb technician or somebody who was going into an inferno, uh, a very uh, metallic type suit with this big bulky hood. Is I, don't, I haven't seen any pictures, but from the descriptions that I've heard in all these interviews, that's what it sounds like. Was it, was it a big, massive, you know, seven, eight foot type creature, or was it more four or five foot in size? That was more in the in the range of uh, four or five feet tall. He did not uh, describe the robot type creature as being significantly larger than the humanoids. Just a little bit bulkier, uh, walked a little bit more stiffly, and just gave the impression of being a manufactured or mechanical creature. Ruben, before we go into the news, did Mr. Shrum feel like he was being pursued? Did he feel like he was the hunted in this case? Oh, yes. In fact, after we get back from the news, it really gets interesting where then comes the where both the robot and the two humanoids are trying to capture him. Yeah, this is an interesting story. Joining me on the phone this evening, Noe Torres, Ruben Uriarte. We were talking about an encounter in Cisco Grove, which is over off of the border of California and Nevada. Great hunting, uh, very, uh, very much a wilderness. We have a hunter by the name of Donald Shrum who gets separated from two of his hunting partners. He's on a high ridge. He has set three signal fires uh, because he knew he was in trouble. He was in a strange land, and with his military background, he knew that setting three signal fires would be a good way to attract attention. Indeed, he did, but the attention he attracted was not a helicopter. It was not of this world. It was from another world. When we come back, we're going to meet these robots face-to-face, find out if they're friendly or aggressive. And uh, let me just give you a forewarning. They're not very friendly. My name's Denny Smith, along with Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte, right here on 93 WIBC. This evening, we are talking to... uh, a couple of UFO investigators. They're the real deal, folks. Noe Torres, Ruben Uriarte. They've written a book called Aliens in the Forest. It is the story of a young hunter who was 26 years old at the time. If I've added it up correctly, that means he's about 74 or 75 now. He gave an interview uh, very early on with uh, a fellow who has now gone home to God. His name was Paul Cerny, and he was with NICAP, and he had done an original interview with this gentleman. His name is Donald Shrum, and then uh, follow-up interviews were taken, and they matched the story even after the passage of years, which gives it so much credibility. Noe, uh, here we are with this robot creature who is starting to show some aggression towards Mr. Shrum. Um, did he expect aggression uh, from from conversations or, or from your investigation? Did he feel threatened at all times through this process? Mr. Shrum said that he he was hoping that there would be no aggression toward him, of course, because of the fact that he was hiding up in the tree and was out of their direct line of sight. And even though they had taken notice of him early on, they didn't seem to be, at that point, too concerned with him. In fact, he, he mentioned that they went about their business of looking at the surrounding vegetation, breaking off little pieces of it, the humanoids did, and then the uh, appearing on the scene was this strange mechanical looking creature and uh and meantime there's there's a key element here and that is that it appears that there were both visible and audible signals being exchanged both among the creatures themselves and also between the mothership whoever was aboard the mothership and the creatures down on the 
the ground below. So, Ruben, w- Ruben, uh, was that the cooing or the uh, the the hoot owl things that I, I have read about? Is that was that with the owl noises? Yes, uh, <clears throat> what Don had referred to that this, it, it reminded him of of almost like a like an owl. Um, the sounds of of uh, reminded him of that very very much. All right, so now we have this robot creature, and he's the really the first one to show any aggression towards Mr. Shrum. This is, uh, this is what took place. He was about seven feet from me. He touched his mouth, and uh, kind of a steam vapor come out of his mouth, and it lit up his face so I could see some detail. I, I blacked out when that steam hit me. I guess it was. It was kind of, kind of took the air from me. And I'd gasp for air and then black out. And I fell over my bow. And that's the only thing that kept me in the tree. So I figured they were out to get me then. All right, now to reset this, our hunter, uh, once he felt threatened, started climbing this pine tree. And he's pretty far up in this pine tree. Uh, Reuben, what did Mr. Shrum think these creatures were trying to do to him? And, and how did he react to the gassing? Well, as he mentioned, that uh, he blacked out, and <clears throat> when he recovered, um, he noticed that the humanoids then all of a sudden were trying to climb up the tree, and that really frightened him, and then he climbed up further up the tree, and then from there, um, he this, the, it turned out to be his own personal war of the worlds between the humanoids, the robot, and himself. He then later um, started to started to break off the branches. He had matches, in the, and he started to throw it down at the base of the, uh, yeah, down at uh, where the uh, humanoids were standing. But the thing that really gets interesting is that he then uses his arrows. Oh, he uses his bow and arrow. He's got his bow and arrow now. Yes. Well, this might be a good time to go to this next clip. Uh, let's sort of pull this one up. Uh, this is a clip of where he talks about this aggression and how he responds to it, our own Donald Shrum in his own voice. I had a 60-pound bow, which is a very high velocity. Since seeing how the robot is the only thing that was causing me harm, I shot the chest area, and it has the velocity of a rifle at that, at that distance because I'm only about seven, eight feet from him. And it, when I hit the chest, the sparks would fly like electrical, like an arc welder, kind of. And then that, uh, that robot backed up and almost knocked him down. He f- f- kind of fell back against a rock and the two at the, at the bottom took off and headed to, for the brush and stood out there about 30 feet from me. And uh, then uh, I shot uh, two more arrows and it was about the same time sequence that uh, these uh, two humanoids would, every time I'd shoot, They'd go back up into the the brush, just out, of, just almost out of sight from me. That's the voice of Donald Trump, a hunter who is being pursued uh, by a uh, a group of UFOs. Uh, we have a mothership that's in the neighborhood of 150 feet uh, long and wide. We have a couple of um, other ships that have joined the fray, and they have delivered two humanoids that are pursuing him at the base of a tree where he has been lost uh, and separated from his hunting partners. He lit three fires, uh, and thinking that he was attracting a helicopter, he realizes he's attracted a UFO. And he's at, uh, he has now climbed the tree. He's been pursued by the humanoids. He now has um, a robot of sorts who's tried to gas him, actually knocked him out. He woke up and uh, and went on from there. Now, um, Reuben, after the arrows were gone, what did he do next? Well, <clears throat> he, um, being a, an experienced hunter, he carried a lot of um, matches with him, and he started to um, break off the branches, threw them down at the, uh, at the humanoids, 
and the humanoids were, were a little frightened by the fire, and they would stand back. Um, he then, because the, the tree was so barren, as he started climbing up further, he started to light his clothes. I mean, he, he lit his hat on fire, we'd throw it down. He even threw his canteen <clears throat> down at, at the humanoids. And one of the things that um, he said that when the canteen hit the ground, that one of the humanoids went up, and look, picked up the pa- can, the canteen, looked at it, and then threw it back on the ground. <laughs> That's that is the voice of Ruben Uriarte. He's an investigator. Uh, he, along with his partner Noe Torres, have written the book uh, "Aliens in the Forest." Um, Noe, I'm going to come to you. Um, one of the things I'm struck about is that we have two humanoids who seem to be protected. We, we've got the scientists, and then we sort of have the soldiers. Do you get the feeling that that the uh, robots are the are are designed to be aggressive? That they are the ones that are uh, sort of the, the the aggressors in this case, and the other ones are just sort of standing back? Because every time something happens, the two humanoids head for the woods. Did I did I pick that up in the story correctly? That's correct. And the other part of it, as we just briefly mentioned earlier, is that there was some kind of signaling going on from the mothership to these beings. And Mr. Shum told us that it was his distinct impression that whenever these sounds that sounded like either an an owl uh, hooting or a bird cooing, there were these strange noises. He got the impression that every time he'd hear those noises, the behavior of these creatures would change. For example, they would start to try to climb the tree, uh, the humanoids would, or the robots would come closer and emit more gas up into the tree. One of the things that I've picked up about him, now you guys have met him, but Noe, he, he just seems incredibly uh, able uh, and, res- and resourceful. I would have had the holy bejeebers scared out of me. I don't, I don't know how I would have reacted, but he seemed so cool and calm on his feet with all the things that he has done. Did you sense that he was uh, uh, acting out of fear? There was a lot of thought process in what he was doing here. He told us that at the point where it became clear that they were how to get him, as he put it in that video clip we heard a while ago. At that point, he he was determined in his mind to somehow make it back home to his his uh, recently, you know, the the lady that he had recently married, loved very much, and their young one year old daughter. Uh, he had, you know, he was despairing at many times during the encounter. It seemed that there was no way that he could hold off these strange beings from from grabbing him but always in the back of his mind was this strong determination to make it back home to his wife and and little girl that's the voice of ruben torres now when we come back in his own words we're going to listen to uh, donald trump talk about what he did to fight off uh, the two uh, humanoid um, aliens along with um, what I'm just going to call the monster robots that were attacking him, both with gas and we will find out what else. When we come back, we'll hear from Donald Trump in his own words. How do you fight an alien? Well, you're going to hear firsthand what they did back in 1964. My name's Denny Smith, along with Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte, right here on 93 WIBC. 93 WIBC, good evening. My name's Denny Smith. For those of you who are Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, for those of you who are hunters, mushroomers, anybody just goes out in the woods, there is not a day in my life that I uh, cherish more than the time that I have been out in the woods enjoying all of God's nature. Tonight we're learning the story of a man who probably was doing exactly the same. He was a bow hunter, and back in the Cisco Grove area of California, Nevada, right at the border, uh, just a little bit uh, east of Sacramento, was a fellow by the name of Donald Trump. He was a hunter. Back in 64, he entered the woods with three friends. They all were hunting deer and game. They were bow hunters. Two of the friends made it to the base camp, and poor Don Trump did not. Uh, he ended up on a ridge, and uh, he knew that he was a little bit in trouble, so he set three signal fires when he saw some distant lights. He lit those fires and uh, attracted as much attention as he could, And as the lights were coming closer, his spirits lifted, thinking that it was a helicopter. And then he had the holy bejeebers scared out of him when he realized that it was not a helicopter. It was absolutely silent, about a 14-story building on its side. It was cylindrical in shape. It was indeed a UFO. And three lights, panels on the side, out of the center one comes another ship. 
and delivers down to him two humanoids. At that point, he scales a tree. What we are about to listen to here is um, exactly what takes place after he is gassed. Now, before we, we listen to this next clip, which is the longest of our clips and probably our last clip, Noe, it seems to me that they were trying to gas him. Do you think that uh, they wanted to kill him? One of the things that becomes very clear in talking to Mr. Shrum is he did not feel that they were trying to uh, hurt him. Um, they were very obviously using an asphyxiant, which uh, basically what it does is suck the oxygen content out from surrounding from the surrounding air. So an asphyxiant, like uh, the typical ones that we think of are nitrogen, argon, helium, those are probably the most common ones. What they do is uh, they can cause you to black out and, of course, deprived of oxygen long enough, they can do damage. But generally speaking, they're not toxic at all. So it's significant to note that he really strongly felt they were trying to get at him. They felt that they wanted him uh, for experimentation as a specimen or something along that order, but he did not feel that they were trying to kill him uh, because of the fact that they kept trying to knock him unconscious and then climb the tree to get at him. Now, we're about to listen to a tape um of and it's a longer tape, but this is how he fights them off. And uh, again, Ruben, this uh, you you've met this man face to face. You've interviewed him. He must have been the most creative guy <laughs> in the <laughs> world. I mean, all of the things that he has thrown at him. Um, when he was giving you this part of the interview, did you watch his uh, facial features? Uh, how did he behave as he was giving you this part of the interview? Oh. Absolutely. Uh, I was watching him, and as he was telling me this incredible story, and and as I had mentioned earlier, how how hard this has been for him. Um, he was very much. Um, you, you could see it in his in his eyes uh, how he was coming across in his voice, and he was reliving that 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 whole event, and and um, just seeing him. And it just made me, I was just at awe. I said, what was it like to it? Be, be in his shoes, being up in that tree, encountering a, a force from the unknown. I said, this man was using all the resources. He was just a very, very brave man. He was brave beyond brave. That was the voice of Ruben Uriarte, also on the phone with me, Noe Torres. They have written this book called Aliens in the Forest, and it is the story of this hunter. Now, we are going to hear the clip now of after he ran out of arrows. Remember, the, he has a 60-pound bow. He had three arrows. He shot at the robot three times. Each time the arrow would impact uh, the metallic structure of his chest, he said he was shooting for the heart. Sparks would fly as if it were a welder. Now, those of you who are welding know what type of spark that would be. He said it would light up everything. It was a very bright uh, arcing. Now, he runs out of arrows, and... Uh, that's when the fun begins. So let's listen to this clip of what old Don Shrum did after he ran out of arrows. I ran out of uh, arrows, so I only had three left. That's when pomade hair <laughs> is just, I mean, the, the cap I had on was just soaked with oil. You're, this is for your hair? Pomade. Yeah, pomade. from my hair, pomade yeah, or? yeah, yeah, okay. pomade. I always carried uh, all kinds of books of matches with me mm-hmm. when I hunted. And so I lit that cap, and it just blazed up, and I dropped it down the base of the tree. And just in that instant, they they moved back about 12, 15 feet. And the, the, I, I glanced over at the, the ship that was uh, over the canyon, kind of almost level with me. And it was almost out of sight. It was just like a star. It moved that fast just in that second. So then I got the idea that they're scared of fire. So I, I burned everything but my t-shirt and my jeans and uh, come to find out later on that, that it was 32 degrees out and I was shaking and I had a bunch of change and I threw it down and they, they all kind of gathered around it. Well, after I uh, started burning stuff and throwing it down, and I even uh, uh, tied some some of my shirt that I ripped up to a uh, compass, so I could try to hit some brush 
because there wasn't nothing right underneath the tree. I caught a little pile of brush on fire. I figured that would bring the cavalry. <laughs> that uh, when I run out of stuff to burn, I headed for the top of the tree. I broke off the top and threw it down. And, and any time I throw down or, or shake the tree, these humanoids would back up. All right, there you have it. That is Donald Trump talking about how you fight an alien. I don't know what I would do. Um, now, no way, this battle went on all night long. And yeah. uh, one of the things that I uh, was was touched by, he did not seem to be cold, um, which would tell me that he was in full flush of adrenaline uh, fighting these rascals. Uh, did he ever talk about how cold it was? He felt the intense cold afterward, but at the time, of course, this was a battle of wills, a battle for survival, and he, he really felt that if these guys got a hold of him, uh, he would never see his, his family again. Boy, now, Reuben, he talked about, and I, he lit this uh, fire, and he tied it to a compass that he was carrying, which is very typical of, of hunters. You know, we always carry a compass with us in case we get lost and we can follow a, a deadline uh, back to a road or, or whatever. Now, he throws us down and he catches this fire. What he said was that the mothership took off like a bolt. And can you tell me again what, what took place? It sounded to me like it was instantaneous that mothership was gone in a flash. Did I get that part right? Yes, uh, it, it moved very, very rapidly, almost out of sight. And then, then also, they, again, um, the aliens were very much uh, in fear of the fire. And, it, you know, it, Don, <clears throat> as we mentioned earlier, he used his wits and he used the bow and he used fire. I mean, mankind's primitive weapons against a highly advanced technology. We have to believe, uh, do we not, Reuben, that these people could have destroyed uh, that, that, that site in a heartbeat. They have to have some sort of weapon. Do you think that they oh. wanted to harm him in any way? Oh, um, oh they could have. Um, that, that's what uh, both Noe and I have been discussing all along, and, and then also with, with Mr. Shrum and, and the family, is if they really wanted to get him, um, they could have captured him. That's what makes this case much more unusual is the fact that in many of the other uh, UFO cases that involves abductions, and most most of these people are are taken, you know, against their will and are, but he the, and unconscious. The thing that makes this case mo, mo, mostly unique is the fact that he was conscious, and that he did battle them for almost twelve hours. Joining me on the phone this evening, Noe Torres, Ruben Uriarte. They have written a book that I hope you will gather into your uh, possessions. It's called Aliens in the Forest: The Cisco Grove. UFO encounter. Now, this this battle went on all night long, Noe. Um, did he ever sleep? Do you remember anything about him getting any rest throughout the evening? He was not able to sleep at all. In fact, when after it was all over and he did find his way back to camp, he slept for six hours straight um, in an attempt to, you know, recover his his wits. Well, when we come back, uh, we're going to finish up this story with uh, Noe. And Ruben, you may have a question for these two fellows, and uh, we're going to, through through all of the technical expertise that we can muster, we're going to open up the phones for all of you. We're going to finish telling the story, then we'll get to your question. So if you have one, it's 239-9393. It is 1-800-571-WIBC. That's 1-800-571-9422. If you're driving around, you have a Verizon cell phone, it's just pound 9393. When we come back, we're going to figure out... Uh, what happens? Did he end up on that spaceship? What happened to our poor hunter friend, Donald Trump? Well, my name's Denny Smith, along with Noe Torres, Ruben Uriarte, right here on 93 WIBC. 93 WIBC, my name's Denny Smith. You know, uh, when the Pacers do a Western road show, uh, that means we get a little bit more time on air with you, and I'm looking forward to it. Tomorrow evening, we're going to have a retired senior FBI uh, criminal profiler. Her name's Dr. Mary Ellen O'Toole, and we're going to talk about the risks and uh, that are to you about your gut reactions to things. So many times we depend on our gut, and I have to tell you, I've done that most of my life, gone with my gut reaction. Tomorrow evening, you're going to hear a reason why you may not always want to go with your gut. Uh, when we talk to Dr. Mary Ellen O'Toole, she is an FBI senior criminal profiler, retired. 
But this evening, we're talking about UFOs. And uh, a lot of people uh, make fun of me and really give me a hard time about this UFO thing. I've always believed that uh, maybe it's like Ed says, that there's this Goldilocks part of the of the universe. Goldilocks meaning it's not too hot and it's not too cold. And I think it's reasonable for us to believe that there might be other life besides what is here on the good old Earth, third rock from the sun. I, I have to believe there is. And and the fellows that have joined me here this evening, Noe Torres and Ruben Uriarte, they're telling the story of a hunter back in 1964. Now, this hunter is probably 74, 75 years old now. His life uh, changed forever back in September uh, 1964. And uh, so I think I'm going to go to Noe here first. Noe, this battle goes on all night long. What finally happened in the end? Well, in the end, uh, there appeared to be more communication between the mothership and these beings. And then all of a sudden, a second robot-like creature appeared on the scene. Now, this is one of the this is one of the bad guys. I mean, the, yeah. the one that's starting to show aggression. We've got two of these guys now? Right. right. Now, the first one had already attempted uh, to gas, or actually had gassed Mr. Shrum several times while the humanoids attempted to climb the tree and get him, but he was able to fight them off. He would he would uh, awaken fairly quickly after the gassing, and then he'd fight off the humanoids by kicking at them and shaking the tree. But then along comes robot number two, and it joins its companion, the first robot, at the base of the tree. The two robots face each other, and then this blinding flash of light that looks like lightning uh, comes out of the chest of one of the robots and strikes the other robot directly in the chest and gets bounced back and forth, forming uh, an arc pattern of light between them. Uh, it lit up the whole area all around them, and Mr. Shum says in his, in his, later in his interview that he was able to finally get the best look that he had ever gotten at, at the robots and their features. Were they trying to burn the tree down? No, I, I, it's unclear what the function of the arcing light between them was, but at the same time that this was going on, a huge cloud of vapor, much more than had been previously re- been released by the single robot, came up from between the two of them and came up and engulfed the tree in this in this big cloud of vapor, and he was finally knocked out for the last time and the duration of, of this uh, period of unconsciousness was much longer, possibly several hours. And then when he finally awoke from that final gassing, they were gone and everything was quiet and at peace again. That's the voice of uh, uh, Noe Torres. Now, Ruben uh, Uriarte, why didn't he fall out of the tree? Um, how, did he, If he was gassed and he was knocked out, why didn't he fall well, out of the tree? Well, one of the things that he did was he... Uh, when he climbed up to the very top, he wrapped this, his canteen belt around the trunk of the, of the tree. So, uh, when he, as Noe had mentioned, when he was gassed by these two robot creatures and he was knocked out for a period of time, in the morning, he found himself just dangling. And when he came to, that's when he started to climb down on the, from the tree. Now, he was, at this point, uh, Ruben, he was in a T-shirt and his blue jeans. That's all he had that he had not burned up. Is that correct? Exactly. That's correct, and um, later uh, he was able to get back to the campsite, and as Noe had mentioned, uh, he uh, one of the uh, one, of, one of his things that he's found him, and then he went back to the campsite, and he slept there. For, he slept for about six hours. All right, these two robots come together, Noe. They gas him one last time. Then they beat it out of there. Now, when he came down out of the tree, did he did he just <laughs> did he just run like hell, or what did he do when he got to the bottom of the tree? He was extremely concerned that they might still be in the area. In fact, he there, he caught sight of something in the brush, and he scrambled back up the tree and stayed up there for quite a bit longer and until he realized that uh, they were not around anymore. So he came on down. Uh, he saw uh, some of the uh, things that he had thrown down during the night, during the encounter. He found them on the ground. Did he find his compass? Found his compass, found one of the arrows. He threw all of his pocket chains down there. Did he find any of the coins? The coins w- were missing, interestingly enough, and he told us that he later talked to some people who suggested that 
coins tell a lot about a society. For instance, they have dates on them, the names of people, they have faces, faces of, of persons, uh, and perhaps uh, they took the coins as, as kind of a specimen or a, a scientific token of their visit to our planet uh, on that occasion. Uh, so that's what Mr. Shrum feels might account for the missing coins. All right. Noe Torres, Ruben Uriarte, I'm about to introduce you to the listeners of 93 WIBC. We're going to start taking some calls here. So, Danny, the first one we're going to punch up is uh, Kevin, uh, who's calling from right downtown uh, Indianapolis. Good evening, Kevin. How are you? Good evening, Danny. How are you? All right. What's your question for these fellas? Uh, two quick questions. One is, why aren't we getting this information from, from I don't know, government or uh, people that want to make this public? Who's suppressing this from us? And the second question I have is, has the gentleman ever been able to relocate that tree in that area? Was there an investigation? Thank you. I'll take the answer off the air. All right. Thank you, Kevin. All right. Well, that's a great question. Um, let's talk about that, guys. Uh, let's take the second question first. Did he ever go back and try to find the tree with his buddies, or did he just get out of there and never to go back? He never attempt. He never um, had the inclination to go. He was very, very frightened. He never hunted after that. It, he he's told us that it ruined his career as a hunter. And in fact, the other two gentlemen that were with him were also their their careers as hunters were ruined by this. It affected them that deeply. Uh, they, of course, the other two hunters. One of them saw the ship coming down out of the earth out of the atmosphere. And and the other saw how shaken Mr. Shrum was when he finally did make it back to camp. So uh, he really had no uh, urge to go back. Uh, they did, uh, and I have to backtrack here, he did go with his brother and a few others to take pictures of the scene about two or three weeks after the encounter. They did go back, they took pictures, but after that, after that one return visit, uh, shortly after the incident, they they never did. Uh, he never has gone back. All right, thank you, Noe. Ruben, um, did you uh, get the feeling uh, that uh, that it's my understanding there was an interview that was done by the Air Force or or by somebody from the government? And uh, the the second question was why was this suppressed? Do you believe it was suppressed? Do you believe that they tried to make uh, some baloney explanation, or do you feel like it was a a, a straightforward investigation by the authorities? Well, basically, that's what happened. Uh, was that uh, after the event, uh, Mr. Shrum's mother had encouraged him to speak to an astronomer, which uh, later the astronomer encouraged him to to go and speak to the Air Force. So both he and his wife went to a air base here in Sacramento, and they met with two uh, Air Force officials, which we found out later that they were connected with Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which happened to be a part of the uh, intelligence network that were involved in investigating UFOs. So what happened was uh, they went through the interview process and that uh, the officials basically were not taking his testimony seriously in fact, they were suggesting that his that perhaps it could have been uh, some teenagers uh, that were out there uh, creating a hoax, or some renegade Japanese soldiers that were uh, hiding in the forest. They made up a bunch of bogus. Uh, in '64, uh, renegade Japanese. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> what? Well, uh, all right, let's let's. God, that's uh, God bless the government for that one. All right, let's grab another call here. We've got uh, Randy up next, uh, who's on a cell phone. Let's pull him up here. Hey, Randy, how are you? Fine, thank you. All right, what's Bye. your question for Ruben and for uh, for Noe? Well, I was curious since he was an outdoorsman. Uh, did he he understood these were like bird calls? Did he try to communicate in any sort of way? Oh, that's a great question. You know, uh, I had heard that there were coyotes. Uh, Yelpin, was this, uh, what, t- tell me how the coyotes or the coyotes came into all this. This is a very interesting part of the story that he heard uh, there were coyotes uh, noises out in the distance in the nearby woods. And so Mr. Shrum, and, and this tells you how focused he was on surviving this incident, what he decided to do was he himself imitated the call of coyotes and and his thought was that perhaps these alien beings would think that he had friends out in the woods coming toward him to rescue him. 
So in other words, he wanted to sound like a coyote so that they would think he was with those coyotes that were off in the distance. Unbelievable. He was part of their team. Absolutely unbelievable. That's the voice of Noe Torres along with Ruben Uriarte. When we come back, we'll wrap up this story, get a few more of your calls in here, and then tell you how you can learn more. We've even got an Indiana link for you for those of you who are interested in MUFON. Uh, Ruben has been kind enough to send us a link, and we will tell you what that is. You're listening to The Denny Smith Show. My name is Denny Smith, along with Nori Torres and Ruben Uriarte, right here on 93 WIBC. Well, my name's Denny Smith. I have enjoyed meeting a couple of fellows, one from the California area, one from South Texas. That's where Noe Torres is from, Ruben Uriarte from out of the great state of uh, California. Gentlemen, I have enjoyed your company. Ruben, I want to go right back to you and ask you a, a quick question that's based on our next caller. So let's, uh, let's get Dale up here next. He's from the south side of Indianapolis. Dale, good evening. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Uh, what question do you have for Noe and, and Ruben? Well, I'd kind of like to ask them if any of them got sick with any kind of radiation or any kind of bacteria, because it seemed to me like uh, if these people come from another world, they'd be carrying something or they'd be taking something back. You know, uh, that's exactly where I was going to go with Ruben. Ruben, did uh, did Don Schramm, our uh, 26-year-old hunter who just shows up in the woods and then spends a night in the tree, with all of this gassing, with all of the contact with these robots, you know, within close proximity, and then our two humanoids, did he ever have any serious uh, health effects from all of this? Well, uh, physically, um, one of the issues that he had were it was respiratory, and uh, it could have been from the exixients that the uh, the aliens were using in terms of the vapor to knock him out, or also because he worked around chemicals at, at the Aerojet plant because he was a welder. But the other thing that uh, he did suffer quite a bit was um, he had, of course, um, nightmares for for approximately two years. And oh, uh, there was he did have fear that he might have been exposed to radiation. But fortunately, none of the symptoms uh, uh, he didn't encounter any any radiation symptoms afterwards. But the thing that he did encounter is uh, the obvious signs of post traumatic stress syndrome. And this is what uh, what he has had to deal with all throughout to, through today. Did he speak um, of nightmares? Did he just speak of anxiety? Uh, when you say uh, he would he would wake up and say, "Those eyes, those eyes." Oh boy! And so it really got to him. Uh, <laughs> it's sort of gotten to me. Now, I just got a text from my neighbor. She's got three daughters. And uh, one of them, uh, Hannah, has said it's too much for her. She's scared out of her wits, and she stopped listening. So I have to assume that even just hearing this story has got to be frightening. But but here I am, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm getting ready for my seventh decade, and this has really gotten my attention. Um, Noe, here's, the, here's the, the thing I want to ask you. If people want to learn more about incidents uh, such as Donald Trump, do you guys have a website where people can find out more about these type of things? We have a lot of information on our website. We've got eyewitness testimony from Mr. Shrum and from the other eyewitnesses in the other cases that we've investigated at roswellbooks.com. Roswell, spell it for us. It's R-O-S-W-E-L-L, books.com. And uh, we, uh, Ruben and I have, have put together six six books on major historical UFO cases, so We've got quite a wealth of information there. Uh, we have video clips, audio clips, and text information. I think folks would really enjoy that. And, and of course, they'll also have an opportunity if, if they choose to uh, to purchase some of our books as well. Right. Let's, uh, let's talk about one of those books. Ruben, this latest book, Aliens in the Forest, the Cisco, C-I-S-C-O, Grove UFO Encounter, what's the best way for folks to get that, Ruben? Well, as you know, you had mentioned one way is going through to our uh, website, roswellbooks.com. It could also go to any other major online booksellers, and uh, especially Amazon.com if they're, if they're interested in purchasing the book. And uh, we encourage everybody who's interested in um, to please uh, take a look at this book and, and also the other, other books that we have written. And also a plug for MUFON.com. For those that are interested in, in furthering exploration into the whole UFO phenomena, we have a very large chapter in Indiana, and I'd like to encourage those folks that, are li- that live locally to attend. I believe they have meetings there in Indianapolis. Yes, uh, folks, there's no www. Just uh, after the two forward slashes, type in indianamufon.homestead.com. 
com. And for those of you who want to uh, learn more about this, um, that is a good place to start. Uh, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash Indiana MUFON, M-U-F-O-N dot homestead dot com. Hey, real quick, Noe, before I let you go, um, in this situation, did anybody ever do any what I call police drawings or did anybody do any graphical depictions of what the humanoids or the uh, monsters, the uh, the robots looked like? Yes, actually, we have over 100 graphics in the book, many of which were drawn by the witness himself, Mr. Shrum, and then uh, some uh, actual um, artists, professional artists, took what he drew and enhanced it. But we included both of Mr. Shrum's, Mr. Shrum's work as well as the artist's work in our book. So definitely it's looked at from many different angles. All right, folks, there you go, roswellbooks.com. Uh, Noe, Ruben, thank you so much. I think I'll be back in touch with you. I'm going to, to explore this just a little bit more and see some of these other stories that you have. But you guys are great storytellers, and I want to thank you both for your time. Ruben, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Danny, for having us on. You bet. And Noe, thank you, too, okay? It was a pleasure, and thank you very much. All right, and we'll be posting this at uh, uh, wibc.com forward slash Denny. We post these things, so I hope you'll be able to find them. So, fellas, thanks for all your time. Folks, tomorrow evening uh, I'm going to have a, an FBI retired senior profiler. Her name is Dr. Melia, Mary Ellen O'Toole. Those uh, times that you feel in your gut that somebody's all right, I'm going to give you a reason to maybe uh, double clutch just a little bit and and hear the darker side of uh, criminal profiling. Well, my name's Denny Smith. I enjoy my evenings with you. We'll be back tomorrow evening right here on 93 WIBC.